Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Ah, good morning, everyone. My name is Anne Maria, and I am an alcoholic. <clears throat> um, okay, step two and three. Well, last night we talked a lot about the physical craving and the mental obsession, and that um, basically because of the way that my body processes alcohol with respect to the physical craving and the way that my mind works, telling me I can drink again, even though I just practically set stuff on fire and like blew up a town caused by alcohol, somehow I can still drink again like an hour later, um, I am completely powerless over alcohol. And... Um, that powerlessness, my life becomes unmanageable. And the unmanageability we talked about last night was on page uh, 52, which is very often referred to as the bedevilments. Um, and the reason that I like to always refer to page 52 is because it's a good barometer for me as I continue to stay sober. It's a good barometer to me to see where my unmanageability is. And so I just want to go back to page 52 and take a look at that second first full paragraph, um, I guess it's the second full paragraph. And uh, the reason I like it is because when something's going on with me and I just don't feel right and, um, you know, I'll, I'll sit there and I'll talk to my sponsor or I'll talk to other people in my network and it's just, just things aren't setting well. A lot of times I'll go back here and I'll ask myself, am I having trouble with personal relationships? I turn them into questions. Can I control my emotional nature? Am I a prey to misery and depression? Can I make a living that is satisfactory to me? Um, do I have a feeling of uselessness? Am I full of fear? Am I unhappy? Do I seem to be, do I seem unable to be of real help to other people? And for me, I use that as a barometer in terms of where I'm at and do I need to take a look at something because when I start answering these questions is yes, yes, I'm having problems with personal relationships. You know, I cannot control my emotional nature. I can't stop crying or I can't stop being angry or, or whatever. And these things come up for me in sobriety. You know, just because I've done the steps doesn't mean I'm like, you know, the Wizard of Oz skipping along the railbook road, always happy, and, you know, joyous and free. These things come up. When I'm feeling that way, for me, I go back to step one. I take a look at my unmanageability. I take a look and I remember who I am, that I live upon God's power and God's power only, that without God's power, I'm going to be living under underneath a bridge drinking every day if I'm lucky, that I don't necessarily need to drink for this disease to kill me in my head. Because... What I was doing for a while was at any time something wasn't feeling right, I would go back to step four, and I would just immediately start inventorying it. And what I found for me that that doesn't necessarily work because that's how I started to push God out of the whole equation because now I'm sitting down and I'm like, okay, I have a resentment against Dave for being funnier than me. And, uh, <laughs> and then I'd go through the columns, right? And at the end, I'm like, okay, this is where my part is. This is what I'm doing wrong. Okay, yep, thank you, God. Turning it over. Yep, got to move along. Go make amends. Make my amends. Good. Now I should be happy, joyous, and free. And that's exactly how I plow through. So when I have something going on, I go all the way back to step one. Because my process started in step one. So I go back to step one. And I get reminded about why I'm doing this. I get reminded as to... And I get to see where is my disease playing out today? Because it's still, it's still here. I still like, you know, my disease and I coexist every day. So page 52 for me is a very good place to start when I have something going on. And that brings me to step two, you know, came to believe that a power greater than myself would restore me to sanity. And for a long time, and I know people always say, you know, it says came to believe. Like, you know, you don't start step two by being like, yes, I have a lot of faith, you know. You're not standing there and you're like, okay, I believe in God, let's move along. It's, it's a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves. And the chapter We Agnostics was extremely and continues to always be beneficial 
for me in terms of gaining that willingness. But my willingness for step two comes directly from step one. The more I realize that I cannot live upon my own power, the more that I realize that I, on my own power, cannot handle my day, the more willing I am to believe that there is a God out there, that there is something out there that can help me and go through my day. And um, on page 44, it talks about what I touched on last night, where it says, you know, Basically, the fa we have to face the fact that we must find a spiritual basis of life or else, right? And only we are told that we are either doomed to an alcoholic death or we're going to live on a spiritual basis, and those are alternatives. But only we alcoholics are like, you know, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to think about which really I want to do. Now, if my step one is thorough, I know which one I want to go because I know that my alcoholic death means whether I'll drink or not. And... What happened for me was that when my sponsor told me, you know, lack of power was my dilemma and continues to be, she started to point out little nuances in the book where the next paragraph it says, well, that's exactly what this book is about. The main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself that will solve your problem. It doesn't say that will help me solve my problem. It doesn't say that will bring you someplace else that's going to solve your problem. It says we're going to find a power greater than yourself that will solve your problem. He or she, whatever you believe, will take care of it. I do not need to necessarily be in that equation. I need to show up. I need to gain the willingness. But God will take care of it. And for a long time, I really thought that that sentence, or I interpreted that sentence to say that, God will help me take care of my problem. And it's a lot easier than that. It's a lot easier than that. He actually will do it. And um, in the beginning, I, I was one of those people that, you know, I didn't necessarily have a lot of animosity against the Catholic Church or against, you know, a Catholic upbringing. I wasn't like, you know, I hate God, but I just wasn't really friends with God. You know, God was... I went to Catholic school for many years and I took theology every day um, because I think I think I took theology probably more than I took English um, in that school. And I literally treated theology as a history course. Like for me, it was really cool to hear all the stories about Peter and all the stories about Paul. And I liked Judas and I liked all of these stories. And I definitely like related to them and got a lot out of them as stories. But that was the end of it. It was just, oh, yeah, that's really cool. And then Peter, you know, he went over here, and then Paul went over there, and he was hanging out with this guy. And, you know, and when I came into AA, it was almost the same thing. I really identified with a lot of the stories and everything, but I couldn't get, I couldn't get by past the identification of the stories to, um, to God speaking through them. I couldn't, I couldn't get there. And for whatever reason, I felt like God was this thing that I had to figure out that I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to believe in this God, then, you know, my very, very first sponsor after like, you know, I had like two days sober was like, write down your conception of God. And I was like, what, is, what do you mean my conception of God? And, and then somebody else told me to do that. And I was like, I don't know. And that was one of my famous things. It's like, you know, if I just don't want to deal with it, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know, just because I just don't want to deal with it. So can't you just tell me this answer because life is a lot easier. If you just tell me the answer, I'll do it, whatever you say. And um, so, of course, I finally found sponsors who were like, no, I'm not going to tell you the answer, and uh, which I was not very happy about. And when somebody was like, God sent that to you, I was like, I don't like God. Nope, don't like him at all because of that. So um, what happened for me was that um, as I started to go through this program, somebody actually said to me, and um, I do it even today, somebody said to me, look for God on a daily basis. Everywhere you go, just look. And so when I started doing that, I was like, all right. So I started like looking at the clouds, and I started looking at the trees, and I started looking at nature. And for me, nature always brings me back because my ego will take credit for everything, Right. Except I can't tell you that I made those trees. You know, I can't tell you that I made those clouds. I can't tell you that, you know, I direct the animals on where to go and how. And so for me, the beginning of my relationship with God always came down to nature because it was the one thing that I knew I couldn't explain. And um, as I started to go through sobriety, 
and especially when I went through the steps again at seven years, um, I went through we agnostics in such a way where I even started to see that um, on page 46 it talks about, it says, let us make haste to reassure you we found that as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice and express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commenced to get results, even though it was impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God. I don't have to define God. I don't even have to understand God. On some days, that's a relief. On other days, that's terrifying. But... The fact of the matter is, is that if I truly understand God, I am saying I am equal to God. The fact is, is that I don't know God's plan. I do not pretend to know God's plan. My job is to show up. My job is to show up for life with the laying aside prejudice and expressing even a willingness to believe. That's my job. And for a long time, I didn't understand that. And a lot of times, in a lot of these types of meetings, we say the uh, set-aside prayer. That's where the set-aside prayer type comes from, is that in steps two and three, well, I guess it's really more a lot in two, but it constantly talks about saying, lay aside your prejudice. Lay aside your old ideas. Lay aside what everything that you think is right and just be open to whatever comes. You might be right. You know, as a sponsor women who are like, but I know I shouldn't kill people. I'm not telling you you should, okay? What I'm saying is lay aside everything you think is right. We're going to take everything that you believe, we're going to throw it up in the air, and you need to trust that the right answer, that whatever God has for you will land, okay? So we set aside everything that we think, and then we express a willingness to be open to whatever comes. And this is not something that I on my own power can do. This is something that I say in the set-aside prayer, so God does it for me. And my job is to show up. And the reason that I highlight that is because, for me, um, after the first time through the steps, I, I, I started, um, my conception of God continually changes. And what I came to find out was that for my sobriety to continue, my God had to be a living God. And I didn't really know what that meant, and I didn't really like that whole concept, because I was like, what do you mean, God? What do you mean God's living, right? And uh, and it was, somebody had said to me, um, you can't put God in a box. And I was like, I don't understand what that means. And they said, when you put God in a box, you're putting all these labels on what God is and is not. And that goes against what our literature says. Our literature says, lay aside prejudice and express a willingness to believe. And for me now, what that means is that I know, because of my step one, that I must live upon a spiritual basis. And I know, because of my step one, that if I don't do that, if I don't continue to grow spiritually, I will die an alcoholic death, whether I drink or I don't. And so, when I come to step two, in the morning... I express my willingness to believe. I ask God to set aside all of my old beliefs, to set aside everything I think is right, to set aside everything I think is wrong, and to just help me live today and show me whatever that truth is. And then my job is to get up and to put my foot forward in the day. That's pretty much my program. It doesn't get much more complicated than that. Um... One of the things that, in terms of the living God for me, is that it's changed over the years, and things that I always thought were really wrong have necessarily become maybe not so wrong. Things that I always thought were really right were necessarily not so, you know, not so right. And having that open mind and being willing to experience life as it's handed to me has um, enabled me to come to a place where, on page 55, it talks about... Um, and I'm going to read the, I'm going to actually read the whole paragraph, um, where it says, actually, we were fooling ourselves, for deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things, but in some form or other, it is there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are facts as old as man himself. 
we finally saw that faith in some kind of God was a part of our makeup, just as much as feeling we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. He was as much a fact of us as we were. We found that the great reality deep down within us in the last analysis is the only, is, um, in the last analysis, it is only there that he may be found. It was so with us. We can only clear the ground a bit. If our testimony helps sweep away prejudice, enables you to think honestly, and encourages you to search diligently within yourself, then if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. With this attitude, you cannot fail. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. I read that many times. And many times, for me, there was no way that there was God deep down within. For many times, with me, I was always looking outside of myself for God because I didn't understand that the feelings that I have every day, that this human experience that I incur, that I endure and that I get to enjoy is God. It wasn't until it was pointed out to me that, you know, when I look at, I have three little cats at home and these three cats are like my angels and nobody else thinks they're angels because probably they bite people, but they're my angels. Right. And, uh, these angels, every time one of them comes and sits on my lap and they just look at me with those eyes, the love that I feel for them, I used to look at Rocco and be like, that's God. And I could look at little Rocco and say, that's God. And I can still look at little Rocco and say, that's God. But I now recognize that the feeling I have inside when I look at little Rocco is also God. That love that I have when I look at Rocco, I'm experiencing God. And so deep down within all of us is a higher power. It's just a matter of being able to recognize it and being able to understand that it's not, God is not necessarily this great force that comes down from the clouds and, you know, sets a bush on fire for you. He might be some days, you know, I don't know. He might be. But when I look at my cat and that feeling I have, that's also God. When I have a friend who's in pain and I'm feeling that pain with her, that's also my God. I am relating. And when it says that deep down within every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God, that's my God recognizing your God. The connection that I actually can get with people today is my God connecting with your God. And when I started to be able to recognize that on a daily basis in my life, God became very real and God became a living God in my life. One that I could actually experience as I went through my day. Because again, this book is meant to transmit an experience. AA is not something to be done in our head. It's something to be done with our heart and in our life. And the only way that I know from my head to my heart is with my feet. That's the only way that I ever get there. And, uh, one of the things that my sponsor had pointed out to me, um, was when I went through the, I had done this exercise with her and, uh, I went through the bedevilments with her as a step one exercise, like I just explained. Well, then I went through the bedevilments as a step two exercise. And she asked me on my own power, can I stop having problems in personal relationships on my own power? Can I control my emotional nature? On my own power, can I stop being vulnerable to misery and depression? On my own power, can I make a living that is satisfactory and keeps me happy? On my own power, do um, can I feel useful all the time? And my, on my own power, can I stop being full of fear? And the answer for me was, on my own power, no, I can't. I just can't. On my own power, these things don't happen. And... um then she had me go through the same questions, asking myself, all right, well, if on my own power I can't do this, what if God is nothing? If God is nothing, am I going to have trouble with personal relationships? If God is nothing, can I control my, you know, will I be able to control my emotional nature? If God is nothing, will I still be a prey to misery and depression? And go through the whole paragraph that way. And then, of course, the next question came. Well, what if God is everything? <laughs> and the only way my answer changed was, well, then there's hope that I won't have personal problems with personal relationships. If God is everything, I might not be a prey to misery and depression. If God is everything, 
I might be able to control my emotional nature. If God is everything, I might not be full of fear. If God is everything, I might no, no longer be happy. And if God is everything, I might actually be able to help other people. And looking at it that way, I actually saw I had nothing to lose. So then on page 53, when it comes down to the step two proposal, when it talks about being crushed by a self-imposed crisis, which I love that part because I never think my crisis is self-imposed. Um, and uh, I literally get to the point where I can no longer postpone or evade it. In other words, I have run out of room. I had a dead end, and it, it's you got to come down to it. It's either God is everything or God is nothing. What is my choice? Here's where I have a choice. I can choose that God's everything or I can choose that God is nothing. And the best example I have of this is that I went through a period in my life where I was terrified to fly. For whatever reason, I would get on a plane and I would freak out. Or I would freak out before I got on the plane. A lot of times the freak out was always a 100 times worse than the plane. And I always thought I was going to have a panic attack. I always thought I was going to die. I always, I don't know what I thought was going to happen, but I could not get on this plane without freaking out, crying, just total disaster. Carrying uh, teddy bears with me. Like I walk around, I'm 35. I walk around the airport with like huge teddy bears getting on a plane with tissues in my hand. And I'm like, yes, I'm a five-year-old flying. Um, but my, um, the woman that I did this particular work with, would always, I would call her from the airport and I'm like, I don't want to get on the plane. And she's like, is God everything or is God nothing? I'm like, that is not a nice question right now. That is nothing to do with anything. And she was like, listen, if it's your time to die, it's your time to die. And I was like, and that was not comforting either. Thank you. I'm really glad I called you. And, uh, and she was like, if God is everything, you have a chance at getting on that plane, sitting there and getting to the other side. If God is nothing, you're going to crash and you already have that in your head anyway. And I was like, oh, she's like, so which is it? I was like, oh, God. All right, God's everything. She's like, really? I'm like, okay, God's everything. Because the first time I went through this book and somebody asked me, is God everything or is God nothing? I had been in AA long enough to know the right answer. God's everything. Yep, okay, move on, check. And then I moved to step three. But at this point in my sobriety, I really had to actually ask myself, is he everything or is he nothing? If he's everything, I'm going to put my foot on that plane and hope <laughs> that this works out. <laughs> You know, and uh, if he's nothing, well, I already have in my head all these horrible things that are going to happen anyway. So it'll happen. And that was when step two became actually operative in my life. And, and the last thing I'll say about step two is that instead of arrived at this point, we were squarely uh, confronted with the question of faith. We couldn't duck the issue. Some of us had already walked far over the bridge of reason toward the desire shore of faith. I never noticed before this woman pointed out to me that reason is capitalized. That even in AA, my knowledge of the steps, I was relying upon reason as capitalized. I was relying upon my knowledge, my intellectual understanding of things as my God. I'm like, okay, planes, you know, they're well made. They don't crash that often. They're, you know, talented people flying it. I don't really know how to fly. There are a lot of people here trusting this person. I'm not the only person trusting this person. I could go through all of the reasons. Friends of mine would give me the statistics of plane crashes. Friends of mine would be like, you know, you're actually more likely to die in a car accident. I'm like, this is not helping. But, you know, it's like they would tell me these things. And, and the more knowledge you have, the more free you're supposed to be. And I was like, that is not working. Not working at all. I hit a point where it was like, you know what? Take all of that knowledge, put it in that box that I was putting God in. Take God out, put the knowledge in the box, throw the box out the window, and now God and I are going to get on the plane. And I carry a picture of Rocco with me a lot of times because when I need that comfortable feeling, I need that, you know, my God is with me, and I look at that picture and I get that feeling. I'm like, okay, good, you're here. Whew, that was a close one. God almost didn't get on the plane, you know, final boarding call. Um, and uh, the whole thing, though, is that I had this picture when I started doing, when I started approaching it this way, I had this picture of, like, literally, I would be on this boat, and my knowledge and my help from everybody else had gotten me to, like, a mile offshore, and I can see the paradise, and I can see, like, beautiful Fiji. I've never been there, but that's what I think it looks like. You know, I see this beautiful, beautiful paradise, and all I have to do is jump in the water and swim. 
but swimming has nothing to do with my head. So I don't want to jump in the water. And when I choose that God is everything, I am jumping in the water and using my feet to get there. It's not about thinking at that point. It's not about understanding at that point. There is no comprehension. It is about put it in action. It is about dive in the water and start paddling. And that's why I say, you know, it's it, the, the chapter initially starts off telling us we don't have to comprehend God. We don't have to understand God. We just have to be willing to grow closer to God. That even as I stand here and I continue to try and grow closer to God, my head is the number one thing that gets in the way of that. My head will bring me to a place where I know I need to trust. My head will bring me to the place where I can take a look at my life and say, yes, on my own power, I can't do these things. My head will bring me to a place and say, okay, I'm willing. Let's open it up. I'm willing. Set aside everything I think I know. I am willing to be open. And then my head needs to turn off if I want to get to my heart and my feet need to start. And that's how step two works. That's how step two started to work for me and my God started to be a living God. And um, it brought me to step three where I, um, I love step three. There's just so much in the big book with respect to step three. But the step three for me was starting to see in that whole paradigm of if my feet are going to start working and I am willing to believe then I need to see the type of trouble my head can get me into. My first experience with step three, basically my sponsor um, at the time had said to me, you know, I want you to go home. And somebody had recently just reminded me of this, which was fantastic. And she made a list of all these things that um, I was no longer allowed to do. And they came out of the pages that are now 417 through 420. She told me to go home and look at all the living skills in there. And, of course, I came back with, like, one skill. And she was like, okay, there's, like, 50 of them. So... We went through and we picked out, you know, about 10 of the skills. It was like, no more criticizing, no more judging, no more, um, help me out here, no more criticizing, no more judging, no more complaining, um, no more lying, no more uh, deceiving, no more manipulating, like a whole bunch of things not to do. And she said, I want you to go home and practice this for two weeks. And I was like, okay, no problem. So I went home, had no idea how hard that was going to be. And uh, I went home and I started practicing them and the only and the whole reason she wanted me to practice them was that she said if you're going to turn your will and your life over to the care of God you need to have a clue of what this might actually look like because if you're going to make an informative decision you don't just buy a car by calling up the dealership and like hey I'll send you a check and you drop it off at my house no you go look at it you take a test drive you pick out your color and then you buy your car and uh so I went home and I started to practice this and for me what happened was is that I was about two weeks in, and I called her, and I said, I don't think I've spoken for, like, two weeks. And she said, why? And she had kind of forgotten. She had told me to do this. And uh, she was like, why? And I was like, because all I do is complain, criticize, gossip, and lie. And I didn't know that. Like, people are like, how are you? And I'm like, I'm great. I wasn't great. I, like, had just run over a squirrel. I was depressed, you know? It was like, people would be like, how are you? And I'm like, oh, my God, listen to what so-and-so did to me. You know, it was like, I just always complaining or like, did you see that person? Did you hear what they did? You know, and when I had to take a look at seeing that I did that, I was like, oh my God, I, I, I can't talk to you without lying. So she had said to me, she, cause she had said to me early on, you know, every time that, uh, you tell the truth, you will have a spiritual experience. And the reason is, is because nobody expects it of you, least of all you, you don't know what it's like to live an honest life. And she was right. I had no idea what honesty was. And so that was what I had to start practicing. And then I started to see that those were the types of traits that put me on page 61 with the actor, that put me on page uh, 62 with the selfishness and the centeredness. And I'm going to touch on that type of stuff actually for my step four presentation. But it brought me to a place where I came to our house and I said, I'm willing. I'm willing to try this. I'm willing to try and turn my will and life over to the care of God. And what I've come to learn is that by the way that I do that is I agree to finish four through nine. That's pretty much what I'm doing. I'm agreeing to finish steps four through nine. But in the meantime, I'm turning my will on a daily basis over to the care of God as best as I possibly can. And by laying aside the prejudice and by showing up and being open, God will show me what that's going to look like each day. And um, we knelt down and we took the third step prayer. And I went home and at some point I started to think, like, what does the third step prayer mean to me? And for me, it says, 
You know, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thy will. Relieve me from the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help. With thy love, thy power, and thy way of life, may I do thy will always. For me, that basically means here I am, God. Build with me and do with me whatever you will. I know I'm going to have difficulties because it says take them away. So take away my difficulties. So that will show other people you exist. Allow me to be your channel, basically. And allow me to help you how relieve me from the bondage of self. And the bondage of self we'll talk a lot about in terms of four through nine. But relieve me from that so that other people see that you are here and they can experience your power, your love, and your way of life through me. And um, it's an incredibly beautiful way of life. And I am just so, so grateful to be part of it today. Uh, with that, we'll turn it over to Dave. like a rock star. Got a roadie. Um, I was sitting over there and I'm like, first, uh, I'm, I've got to tell on us. i got to admit uh, our faults. Um, yesterday, Emery and I, we were driving through New Jersey traffic, running late. Um, I'm not going to blame anybody, but we were running late. Got into traffic. You know, obviously we're not in the moment. Um, we're both on call, so we got two phones ready to ring. They're sitting over there, like if they ring, we got to answer them. And uh, and we got here just in time. Um, sat and got some coffee, and and we're you know decompressing. And um, both of us brought our coffee in here, and we're sitting here waiting to speak. And I had no idea that there was two huge signs at the door saying no food or drink in the chapel. We didn't even know till we went home last night that there was absolutely no food. You know, of course we're special. But uh, it, t it just shows me how quickly I can get out of the moment. To me, God is mo in the moment is truth. Um, and that's kind of what I tried to obtain, which is virtually to me impossible. But I try as hard as I can to stay in the moment. Because I know how easily my mind can just um, create this delusion, can create this world that doesn't primarily exist. Um, you know, we're, let's go back last night. You know, we're talking about step one. Okay, so we have this physical allergy. All right, this physical allergy says that we take the first drink, and the first drink we're basically screwed. Um, we can't stop for whatever reason. We can't stop. So. Um, why do we take that first drink? Well, you know, I believe there's the two obsessions, and I believe I break down the two obsessions with, with people on one is that it is a solution, okay? I believe it's the only solution that's going to help me with that restless, irritable discontent. And the other is that I, if I try hard enough, there's some way, somehow, I'm going to be able to drink like a normal drinker. I can keep this thing in my life. I really believe that if I did not have that in my back pocket, someday, somehow, I'm going to need that. So don't tell me, don't tell me as an adult that I never, ever, ever can feel that way again, that I'm never going to be able to go, man. You know, I used to, people would say, oh, I can't wait till after work and have a drink. Can't wait to happy hour. I can't just wait for that one cocktail. I, you know, and all of these things are in my mind. I'm saying, yeah, I wish I could, but I can't. Because I just know, knew no other solution. I knew n no other way of just decompressing, living life like everybody else seemed to live it. Um, I didn't realize that there's all these other things going on, too. So we have this, uh, this belief that um, it's the only solution I have. And I somehow, if I can work it out, I'll figure out the right formula. I can, where the planets are aligned and it's a Friday and I can have tequila. You know, that way I only drink one. You know, like there's some combination I'll figure out. Friday tequila at four, I drink like a normal drinker. 
And I tried. I tried every possible combination, and it just didn't seem to work out. And from my story, you know, three days later, Dave's driving in a blackout. Okay? It always ended driving in a blackout. Um, yeah, I'm the only person who lost two cars by parking them. You know, like, it doesn't happen to normal people. I lost one in Princeton, and I lost one in Elizabeth. You'd lost one, too? I lost two, you know? So, um... So I have this going on. So what, what, what I need to do, and that's what the book and the program is all about, is I need to find another solution to the restless cerebral discontent. All right? So what's that restless cerebral discontent? What's that ter internal turmoil going on? Okay? And that's where the God thing comes in for me. Um, I grew up in a Roman Catholic uh, household. Uh, anybody else? Roman Catholic, you know, the whole the ceremonial, everything. Um, and I didn't buy into it at a very early age. I remember telling my mom, who went to Catholic school all her life, went to, you know, took us to church. And at Thanksgiving, I decide probably about six or seven years old, I'm going to tell her I don't believe in God. My God, the poor woman. You know, basically had a meltdown at the Thanksgiving table because her child's saying he doesn't believe in God. But that's how I believe. I had no concept. Um, I, um, she dressed me up in this uh, suit with a little, I had brass buttons. And uh, I would sit in the pew and I was catching the light with the brass buttons. And I would just shine it around. That's what I did all, and I would just shine it around until one day I got it in the priest's eyes while he's giving the sermon, you know, and he's like blinded. And so the next week I had dull brass buttons, you know. But, but I just, I'm not, I wasn't there. I wasn't available. I wasn't buying into this whole thing. I was looking for life to entertain me. What can I get out of life? Who do, who do I want to be with? Who do I want? I want to be with the Mackinsons over there. They're having fun. They don't get to get dressed up for church. You know, why don't I have to get? And this is where my mind's going, you know. I don't realize that everybody's not doing the same thing, but that's where my mind goes. Just recently, I had to, um, you know, I was talking with a friend. I had to make amends to him because, um, and this seems stupid, but it, I hopefully it illustrates my point. Um, I had his uh, softball glove. I needed a softball glove, so I borrowed his softball glove. And I didn't talk to him for a while. And he wondered what happened. And I honestly, I, I was honest with him. I said, honestly, I couldn't find your glove. And I didn't want to talk to you until I found your glove because I was fearful that you would be mad at me. And now I see some heads shaking. Yeah, you guys kind of get it. He thought I was insane. He's like, you what? You didn't talk to me because of a $35 baseball glove? I'm like, yeah. I'm just being honest. I mean, yeah. But that's what our brain does. When I allow myself to be absorbed in self, when I allow myself to be the director, I'm going to create this play that is just unrealistic. And it feeds into all of my character defects. It feeds into all of my fears, my resentments, my, my selfishness, my self-centeredness, my goals, my, my expectations. Expectations are huge for me. Um, you know, a problem for me. I always have expectations of others. You know, I expect them to do what I want them to do and they don't end up doing it, right? Um, so coming in as an atheist into AA, I was, you know, I was basically um, screwed. I, I don't know why if I say it lower, it doesn't sound as bad. I'm screwed. They didn't hear that, right? I'm not being taped. Um, so, so here's Dave coming into AA, screwed. And everybody is saying, if you don't find God, you're going to die. Great. Got no concept. Do not believe. I'm, I'm dead. You know, what am I going to do? Um, and it was a process. Like I said, I bounced in and out for five years. So first, the first thing I had to get out of my system is that this is going to work somehow. I'm going to find the magic formula, you know, the planets aligned, right, booze and me. And I had to find that combination. When I tried every formula and I was beaten down to the point where I just didn't know, had nowhere else to turn, there I was. And... Um, there was two things that happened for me. One was 
um, during this period, people were like, find God, you've got, you've got to find God or you're going to die. And I remember driving home. Now, I know this is a crazy story, but I share it because it's a crazy story. And it, it shows you where you can, might be able to find it. If you're open and willing, it will happen for you. It will appear. You just have to be open and willing. So I'm the scientific, scientific engineering guy that needs proof of God. You know, no matter what, you know, you weak people got to believe in him. Okay. You know, because you're idiots. I'm just superior intelligence. And um, the weak people have to believe in a God so they can get through the day. This is where my mind is, right? So I'm driving home and, and people are like, get God or die. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I'm driving home and I'm listening to my favorite radio station and they have John Edwards. And I don't know, some of you might know John Edwards. My mom loved John Edwards. And at this time, he was doing, he does readings and he's reading this woman and he, and everything he is saying is just to me impossible for somebody to know without there being a connection. Okay. At that time, it was enough to send chills down my spine. All right. At that moment, it dawned on me in the car, driving home from work, listening to the radio. Maybe this is true. Maybe he is that maybe there is something after life. And I thought if if that's possible, then maybe if there's one person that would look after me, after he died, would be my grandfather. He died when I was four. Most people said, we, I got chills just saying that. Most people say he's, he's here. Uh, most people said that we were exactly like, I, I, I sat on his knee. I went to the same college he went to. I followed his footsteps in a lot of ways. And he was my mom's dad. And a lot of people um, even said that we looked alike. And I thought, if anybody's going to be my guardian angel, that would be him. So... If John Edwards can talk to him, so can I. I don't know why today that hit me. So the the way the door was open was just a communication with my grandfather. Uh, just talking to him. It was that simple. Could I have created that? Probably not. Could my sponsor have come up with that plan? No way. No, I don't care how many exercises he gave me or how many big, big books I read. John Edwards is not in here, by the way. That that story, that plan could not have evolved on uh, by by design. That had to be happen because I was open and willing to the universe, and and when I was ready, it showed itself. That makes sense. Okay. Whew, man, that got emotional. I don't think I've ever told that story and got that emotional. I don't know why. So something I got to be open and willing to something. Um, so, so here's this, and so that's the first door that came open. So I, I'm now willing. Second one, uh, second situation that happened was um, uh, when I entered rehab. Uh, I, like I said, I'd been bouncing in and out of AA for five years. I finally got into rehab. It was the last place I was ever going to go, and it ended up in rehab. And uh, the last day in rehab, um, I'm sitting with my roommate, like most roommates do, and we're, we're telling stories about how the future's going to be great, you know. And he had been in eight rehabs, and he's telling me how his life plan. He had a life plan. He's explaining it to me. I'm listening to him. And for whatever reason, he said, hey, before we go to bed, let's pray. pray. I'd never gotten on my knees and honestly prayed in my life. Not even, when I got confirmed, I had to lie about how many sins I had had because I had no idea what he was talking about. Like, when you have to lie in confirmation, you know, to your priest, I made up a story. I'm like, yeah, I lied ten times, sure. And he goes, go do, you know, ten Hail Marys. I didn't even know what a Hail Mary was. I went and I knelt and I looked around. When another kid got up, I got up. I mean, that's how I prayed. I knelt when everybody else knelt. I stood up when everybody else stood up. I mean, that's what we're taught. So I'm, he's having me kneel, and I kneeled. And, and, I, and I said the most honest 
thing that I could have said is, I don't even know if there is such a thing as you out there, but if there is, I, you know, I need help. And I can tell you from that moment on, from going for five years and can't get more than 30 days, I left that hospital and I didn't have an obsession ever after that. And the only reason I know that and the only reason I can identify that is years later looking back at it. Not because I walked out and go, wow, I don't feel like a drink. I walked out going, holy crap, how am I going to make it through the day? <laughs> I, 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 my dad picked me up, and that night I was at a meeting. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I just kept moving that way. I was scared to death. However, what I didn't realize until years later, I wasn't obsessing like I used to. I couldn't go through a day without thinking about getting a drink, but I wasn't obsessing. So for whatever reason, that helped. And I share that because, you know, if anybody hasn't tried it, what the hell, you know? Unfortunately, that roommate went home and didn't go to a meeting. That roommate uh, met somebody in rehab. Um, you know, it was different. They were in love. You know, so, of course, you, you, really, you, they were different, okay? Um, so they were in love. They, they, they hung out together, and two weeks later, he was dead. I look at that, and, I, you know, I kind of like, why me, why not him? I, I really, truly believe that part of his duty was to introduce me to God. Part of his job was to be there and have me kneel and pray. So I, I take that as a gift. He was put one of my angels that throughout my life, and I, I, I respect that and I honor that and I try to carry that message with me to when I help work with others. So those were the two main, you know, big important things that I see as as part of my transformation or part of my introduction to a higher power. Everybody's individ is very different. Um, I I you know. I try to step back in this process, especially working with people. Um, the first time that I was taken through this, uh, it was it was by the book. You know, um, we sat, we talked about it. I mean, actually, my really first sponsor, he took me out to a park and he said, "Who made who made the grass green?" You know, like it was one of those, like, "What about the birds and all that?" And I'm sitting there, like, "What the hell are we doing here?" You know. Like, the guy's going to make a move on me? What, why are we in the park? We're alone, on sitting on this bridge. You know, it was very romantic, but come on. And I really, it was just in one ear and out the other. It was, all right, yeah, whatever, all right. Um, uh, the next time I did it, um, and we got to the third step prayer, honestly, um, and some people know this individual, uh, you guys probably all know Chris. Uh, Chris S. Um, he, you know, when you, when you're working with Chris at the time, it was years ago, but Chris had this big music room, and it was three walls of just albums. And every time you went in there, he was playing music. And now I don't, I didn't own an album, you know. I like I had nothing to do with music, so we we had nothing to talk about there. And. Uh, so I'd go in, and you sit on the couch, and he had a dog, Patchouli, and Patchouli would inevitably be intertwined in our work. You know, like he would come in, jump up on the couch, put his head on my lap, you know, would be part of listen to Fifth Steps. Patchouli was very well versed in the big book. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, so all of this is going on, and he's like, okay, we're going to take the third step prayer, you know, and Chris, this is Chris. Okay, we're going to take this separate, man. Let's get down on our knees. And I would get that, and I'm like kneeling down. Dog's going to get ready to hump me, and music's playing, and I'm, I am so not in the mood or in the moment. I'm not thinking God at all. I am like, this is weird. Let's just get this over with. Let's get out of here. Okay. So from that experience, what I do now with guys is, um, and it is, it's actually in here, um, 
they, they say they, you know, it's suggested that you do it on your own. So what we do is, uh, working with guys, we go through the second step and we talk about their conception. It's very individual. What's your conception? You know, you need to have a conception, but what's your conception? Um, this is something that you're going to look for for guidance. It's going to be something that's going to guide you and direct you. Um, I, you know, early suggestion for me was find a, think of a best friend. If you would describe the best friend, what would that be? Somebody that would be there for you, somebody that would always listen to you, would never judge you. All these qualities would be of a friend. I've had people write lists. You know, what would they have as, as a, uh, characteristics of a God? I try not to define it. You know, I find defining it kind of limits it, and, and so I leave it open. And for me, it's changed over the years, so I don't want to stick to one. But, it, again, we're just introducing and we're coming up with a concept to open the, uh, the door. So I want them to come up with a concept depending on the person. I might have them write it. I'm, if they're struggling, we may have to spend more time on that and we'll talk about it. Maybe I'll have them read about it. Maybe I'll have them, maybe they're okay with it. So we'll just go right to the, the third step prayer. Whatever the situation, I want them first to come up with a concept that they're able to, to, to deal with. What I've been, what I do then is I take them, um, nobody's from New Jersey. Uh, I take them to a place that's called the Shrine, uh, and it's near us, um, down in New Jersey. And the Shrine is, um, it's a really spiritual, great place. Um, it's a chapel, it's up on a hill. Um, and they have the stations of the cross all around the field. There's a big field you can walk around. They also have a, a 9-11 memorial. So there's a memorial there, and at, at the uh, 46 of the hour, every hour, the, they have three bells that ring that came from a chapel in uh, Maryland. So it's very spiritual, okay? And the chapel's usually open, and there's usually nobody there. Um, there's a couple of nuns downstairs selling... I was going to say trinkets. That's not nice. Selling religious artifacts, okay? Uh, and they're there and walking around, so it's very quiet. Um, so for me, it's a very spiritual place. And they have meetings there, too. So it is kind of connected to AA. So I'll take guys there, and we'll go through their second step. We'll talk about it in the car. Or we'll talk about it in at a picnic table on the, on the lawn. Um, when they're ready... And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they're okay with their conception. I then say, okay, go meet them. And I have them go into the chapel alone. And I, what I want them to do is I want them to sit, go over their conception, and then do the third step prayer on their own. For me, I feel that that's more significant for them. Because it's very personal. I, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to be directing it. I want them to, to do it on their own. I want them to have their own experience and to, to, you know, feel like it's on their terms, on when they're ready. So when they're done, I said, when you're done, come out and we'll talk about it. And that seems to work, um, for most guys. Um, is it, is it in here? You no. Know, you know, one of the, one of the things that I really stress, um, and this is for me, but this is, this is, this is not the power. We've been talking so far a lot about the power is in God. Power is in the higher power. The power is not in me. The power is not in my sponsor. The power is not in this book. The power is not in the meeting. The power is not in your home group. Okay? The power is God. Your conception, but the power is in a God. Okay? This, these are tools to help you get there. These are tools. We're, we're giving you... And what I believe in is that although there's a framework, I do believe in flexibility from, for... In guiding, I, it's funny because I saw this kind of thing happen where we go through the work, we have a, an experience, um, we start working with others, and when we work with others, all of a sudden we're telling them what to do. Did I forget who I just did all the work to connect with, a higher power? 
but you got to do this. This is right. This is wrong. Um, I forget that I have my connection, so don't I feel comfortable going to my higher power to give me guidance on how I should be leading somebody else? Or am I strictly going to stick to this? This was written back in 1939. It, you know, I think that um, it's beautiful as it is, but things have changed, and I have to be flexible with it. So there are times when I've actually um, changed things, where I've directed guys to different pages because of who they are and where they're at. We, what, I guess what I'm getting at is if you've done the work and you've had experience, you be confident. You're not going to screw up. You're not that powerful, okay? We can't hijack this from God. We can't, you know, I don't believe, I don't believe there's good meetings, bad meetings. I don't believe, you know, that this whole thing was put together and I'm going to walk in and screw it up. I'm helping them. I'm just trying to help them. If I have an intuitive thought, I should really feel comfortable that my intuitive thought might be right. If I'm not sure, check with somebody else. If it's really strong, then go with it. And I'm not talking crazy stuff. I'm just talking little stuff. But we have to feel more comfortable. And the more comfortable I get with that, the better, the, the better I get at it. Um, they're going to see that. And they're going to see the power. The most convincing argument is not the one that I can read to them or the story that I can tell them. It's through my example. And if they see me leading this life, they're going to start buying into, hey, maybe he's got something. Maybe he actually knows what he's talking about. Maybe it's possible. Maybe it's possible. I, too, can, can believe that, you know, hey, what you have been using hasn't worked. How about trying what we're doing? And if I'm not living by that example, then I don't have a really strong argument. So I have to be careful of the example that I'm leading with. And that starts with my guidance in them. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, a couple of heads are shaking. You guys just got to go to the bathroom. You don't really care. Um, we're at the moment, the hour, yes? Do you have anything to throw in? Um, we're going to take a break. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.